Oh, good morning, everyone. So we had a, a grand rounds today. Uh, we had a special uh, speaker today as uh, Dr. Mohil. Uh, Dr. Mohil is uh, uh, attending currently at Rochester University. He is a professor of neurology and college, uh, oncology. He holds uh, the unarrested Charmy professorship. Uh, he serves as uh, the departmental uh, diversity officer the Associate uh, Chair for Career Development in Leadership and Neuro-Oncology Division Chief. He completed uh, his residency in neurology and a fellowship in neurophysiology at uh, Northwestern University and followed by a fellowship in neuro-oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, since 2007, he has been a uh, faculty in University of Rochester. Uh, he completed a master in clinical and uh, translational research. And he has been a very productive uh, academically. He uh, uh, also is a, a vice chair of the AN Neurooncology section and serves as the AN Neurooncology topic work uh, group chair. And he currently serves as the physician lead for the AN Transforming Leaders Programs, the chair of the AN Diversity Officer Subcommittee, and the AN Anti Racism Curriculum Working Group. He's committed to developing a strong, uh, stronger mentorship and a faculty development uh, opportunities and was awarded the uh, University of Rochester Medical School Faculty Mentorship Award in 2021. So we welcome uh, Dr. Mojil. Uh, thank you so much for accepting this invitation also. Thank you, Sergio, and thank you um, for welcoming me to Downstate. I'm looking forward to talking today. Um, about uh, neuro-oncology. Uh, and I hope you can see my slides here. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking today about the shifting landscape of clinical neuro-oncology um, and give you an overview of where we are as a field today and where I think we're going um, in the future. Um, I have uh, one disclosure listed here with Sapiens Therapeutics, and I won't be discussing any off-label use of drugs during this talk. So let's start a little bit with history. Um, if you go onto PubMed and um, put in the search term glioblastoma, uh, this is the earliest um, publication that shows up. And this is from the lab of Dr. Harvey Cushing, uh, and it's a case report. It's a case report um, done in the ways that case reports were done in the past. It has the person's name. Uh, Philip T., uh, 42 years, um, and uh, presented in July of 1927, so um, just over 90 years ago. Uh, he presents with what sounds like a seizure. Um, two months from onset of, of his illness, he's admitted to the cl clinic and given a diagnosis of glioblastoma. Um, after this, he gets x-ray therapy, so sort of our earliest versions of radiation therapy. He ultimately develops recurrence. Um, and he dies 14 months um, from the onset of his symptoms at his home. Um, and what struck me about this case when I first saw it is when I started my fellowship in 2005, um, the course of our patients wasn't all that different. Um, and so in that intervening 70 years, um, we made some progress um, in surgical techniques and our ability to deliver radiation but we weren't making meaningful progress um, in how long patients live. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you today about is where we're going in the field from there. So the first shift that we're really experiencing uh, in neuro-oncology really over the past um, 15 years is a real shift in therapeutics. Um, and so it's a shift to the point where this is now a field um, that really is focused on and thinks about therapeutics. Whereas even 20 years ago, we were very much focused on neurosurgery and radiation oncology. And many of these patients would have been taken care of purely by neurosurgeons and radiation oncologists. So this paper from 1978 is the first randomized clinical trial in glioblastoma. Um, and you can see that with treatments, so radiation, and then or in the this arm radiation plus BCNU, BCNU is a nitrogen mustard um, that works as an alkylating chemotherapy that the median survival in this patient group is about 35 weeks. That's where we were in 1978. Then between 1978 and 2005, not a single chemotherapy is FDA approved for treatment in glioblastoma. 
And this is really during that period where there's been an explosion in chemotherapeutics, um, development of cures for leukemia, um, major advances in lymphomas and breast cancer, um, but in glioblastoma, no real change. Um, and that was until this paper that was published in 2005. So this got published actually the year that I started my fellowship. Um, and this study looked at um, adding chemotherapy, temozolomide and alkylating chemotherapy to radiation um, for the treatment of glioblastoma. And the survival curves here um, show that there was a significant improvement in survival when you added on chemotherapy. And the numbers we have are 14.6 uh, months median survival versus 12 point months, one months in the control group. And now those don't sound like great numbers, um, but when we're looking at median survivals, we really need to be thinking about the tails of the curves um, and how that impacts a greater population of people. And one way to think about that, and that's been helpful for us when we talk about it with patients, is that in the arm that got radiation, 10% um, were alive at two years, um, but more than 25% were alive at two years if you got chemotherapy. And so your chances of survival go from one in 10 to one in four with the addition of chemotherapy. Um, and that was a real shift in how long people lived um, and how we managed to treat the disease and how we have to then deal with survivorship. A follow-up study of that showed that with that treatment, we could actually, for the first time in glioblastoma, talk about five-year survival. And five-year survival rates of 10%, while they are small compared to what we see in many other cancers, um, that was the first time that we could really even talk about that. And that was compared to nearly 0% um, in the radiation alone arm. That work has been followed up across all histologies and gliomas. Um, and so these three papers over the ensuing 10 years demonstrated added benefit of chemotherapy in each of these subsets. So in the top paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, they found that when you added chemotherapy, and here it's a regimen of three chemotherapies, procarbazine, CCU, CCNU, and vincristine, that patients lived on average five to 10 years longer if they got chemotherapy. This was a very substantial survival benefit and a real change in how we approach these tumors um, where they used to often be just observed for many years. Um, when I started in residency, um, it wasn't uncommon that we followed low-grade gliomas in our um, neurology resident clinic, um, not believing that there were real effective therapies. And then the other paradigm was to give them radiation alone and then follow for many years. Um, and so that's been a real shift in that disease. When we look at anaplastic oligodendrogliomas, um, we find that they're extremely chemosensitive. Um, and with chemotherapy, we're not only improving survival, but we're likely curing a subset of these tumors. And then most recently, even in disease like anaplastic astrocytoma, we're finding that with the addition of chemotherapy, very significant improvements in survival. So we're really seeing a role for chemotherapy across these, um, across these diseases. There's been other developments um, in glioblastoma, um, and this is something called tumor treating fields. Um, this has been met with a lot of skepticism, um, but this randomized clinical trial was published in 2017, and patients were randomized to that standard treatment of radiation and temozolomide. Um, and then uh, another arm went to that treatment plus this device. You can see a picture of the device here. Um, it's like a skull cap that you wear. Patients have to shave their heads, place this on, um, and then it's attached to a battery. Um, the biology of this is thought to be, and this is based on preclinical models and some mouse models, um, that this delivers alternating electric fields and that halts mitosis. Um, on the bottom picture here, you can see a picture of one of my patients wearing the device and then um, wearing a bandana on top. Um, in the study, patients wore this for more than 18 hours a day. Um, and um, we found that there was a very significant improvement in survival. And so I'm gonna alert you to these numbers that I have circled here. Thinking back to that two-year survival, that was about 25% in, um, in the experimental arm of the previous study, now the control arm. You add on the tumor treatment fields, and we're looking at a nearly one in two 
um, or 50% survival at um, two years. So this was um, a surprising finding. It continues to be met with skepticism because the biology of this hasn't been really well described. We're not really seeing imaging responses um, with the use of this. Uh, there's great cost. This probably costs about $20,000 a month, but it is currently FDA approved, covered by most insurance companies and has minimal skin toxicity. Um, as this has been implemented since 2017, there's been real challenges in implementation. Um, patients are suspicious of this. Uh, it, it affects their quality of life. They need to shave their heads in order to wear this. Um, and so probably half um, of patients will opt to not go on this um, therapy. So I think we don't really have a great sense of how this is impacting real world survival. The other therapy that's been developed for glioblastoma over the past several years is something called bevacizumab. This was originally treated, um, used to treat colon cancer. It's what we call a VEGF inhibitor, um, and it is anti-angiogenic, so it, it, it starves the tumor of its blood supply. Um, the use of this really came from a single case report from a neuro-oncologist in Texas who gave this to one of her patients and managed to get it and noticed a dramatic imaging response. And that one case report led to several studies. And those several studies all demonstrated really meaningful imaging responses. Um, and this ended up being approved by the FDA for re recurrent glioblastoma, actually based on imaging responses and not based on survival. But the FDA then asked that we, um, as a community, um, put forth a randomized clinical trial in order to justify um, the FDA approval. So those randomized clinical trials happened. They were published in the New England Journal of Medicine side by side, one done by industry and one done by the cancer consortiums. Um, and if you look at these lines, you don't need to be a statistician to know that they're really not different. Um, so there was no survival benefit found from the use of bevacizumab. And after these were published, um, there was real fear that bevacizumab um, would be um, taken away by the FDA, that we wouldn't be able to prescribe that. Um, they have kept um, the indication, um, and um, one of the things that we have learned from this trial um, is that we've been a little bit too focused on survival as one of the only outcomes of benefit here. Um, and that's one of the other shifts that we need to be thinking about, and I'm going to talk about a little bit later, is um, a shift to really thinking about patient experiences and their quality of life. And I'll give you an example of this. This is actually the first patient I ever treated with bevacizumab. Um, right as um, uh, FDA approved this. The panel on the left, this shows her um, T1 with contrast um, scan and below that a flare scan. And at the time of this scan, she was 44. She had recurred four months after her diagnosis. Um, she had a low platelet count. We couldn't give her other traditional chemotherapies. Um, and she came into the office in a wheelchair um, really cogn cognitively not at a point where she could even really consent for this um, and really struggling. Um, and we would have predicted that she would have died within a month or two of that office visit. Um, we elected um, to give her bevacizumab. Um, and two months later, um, this is her MRI. So you can see real reduction in contrast enhancement, but more importantly, a real reduction in cerebral edema. Um, and her symptoms were better. She had been on about 16 milligrams a day of dexamethasone, and at the time of the two-month scan, we were able to get her down to four milligrams twice a day. This is a sustained response. Eight months after bevacizumab, um, she has much further resolution of contrast enhancement um, and near complete resolution of her edema. At this point, she was off of steroids and she was back to work. So there are some real um, meaningful benefits from bevacizumab, and it's it's Greatest benefit is probably in reducing cerebral edema without the toxicity of corticosteroids. Um, and we need to be thinking about how we can design clinical trials in a way where we can get these patient-derived benefits and recognize them and not just the survival benefit. Um, and, and a little bit later, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about how um, we shift our thinking related to quality of life. So the next shift um, has been a shift in genomics and then a resultant shift in classification. Um, and this, um, I'm gonna pull out this quote from Dr. Lisa DeAngelis who um, 
currently is the chief executive at Memorial Sloan Kettering. She wrote an editorial after one of the early um, chemotherapy um, studies in the New England Journal of Medicine um, entitled it Chemotherapy for Brain Tumors, a New Beginning. Um, and one of the quotes in there is that as we come to understand these diseases better and identify biologic markers that will enable us to subclassify this otherwise clinically and pathologically homogenous population, we will improve life for our patients. Um, and this was really um, predicted um, the big shift that has happened over the last 10 years um, where we're thinking about how to talk about and classify these tumors completely differently. This started with a study that came out of Duke that identified um, the IDH1 and IDH2 mutations in glioma. So IDH1, if you remember from medical school, is the isocitrate um, dehydrogenase enzyme from the uh, Krebs cycle. Its exact function in gliomas is controversial and not clearly known. Um, but if you look at these two curves here, these two survival curves, um, you'll notice that patients who had an IDH mutation lived much longer than patients who didn't. This becomes really important because um, this means that there are, this is a prognostic biomarker. And this means that we need to rethink how we interpret all of those clinical trials that I just presented, because we didn't have IDH status in those. Um, and depending on how many patients in those trials had IDH mutations or how many were IDH wild type, it's gonna affect um, what those survival numbers look like. And so that makes it really complicated for us to think about how to interpret those previous trials. And it also tells us that all of our future trials um, and future patient care um, really depends on knowing um, the status of the IDH mutation. This has now become the key classifying feature um, of classification systems. A follow-up study done by the Cancer Genome Atlas um, really um, hit home as to why this is important. If you look at the curve here in the orange all the way on the left, um, this is on, on a survival curve. This is the poorest survival of all of these curves. Um, and this is what we today know as IDH wild type glioblastoma. It fits um, our traditional belief about glioblastoma. When we think about glioblastoma, we think about a tumor that comes on um, in patients in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. It comes out of nowhere. They might've had a normal MRI for another reason just a few months prior, um, but within a few months, they can have an unresectable, large contrast enhancing necrotic appearing tumor um, and typically will die within one to two years. Um, and that is what we are now calling the IDH wild type glioblastoma. But the most interesting finding of this is the curve right next to it with the red triangles. So this has a clinical course really similar to glioblastoma, um, but this is actually low grade glioma, but they have an I, but they have but their IDH wild type, and so this is a real sea change in our thinking, um, where the IDH mutation, the presence or absence, drives our understanding of prognosis even more than histology, and so these would have been patients that prior to this paper I would have seen in the clinic and said, you have a low-grade glioma, we expect survival to be anywhere from then five to 15 year range. Um, but without knowing that IDH status, I would be wrong. Um, if they were IDH wild type, we're looking at a survival in the one to two year range. If they're IDH mutant, we're looking at a survival um, in excess of 10 years. So this has come on into the classification system from the World Health Organization, and this is the 2016 um, World Health Organization classification of CNS tumors. And you can see that in every one of these tumor types, we are characterizing them by the IDH mutation. Our traditional approach to, hit, to histo histologic classification was really based on um, cell of origin, so astrocyte and oligodendrocyte and then the um, accumulated histologic alteration. So this is really based on what the pathologist sees under the microscope. And with increasing grade, we're seeing increasing cellularity, more mitoses, greater microvascular proliferation, and the hallmark of glioblastoma um, being necrosis. So this is the old model of how we thought about these tumors. And in the new model, um, we're really dependent on these molecular classifications. Um, and so if we look at um, the distinctions, we're really dividing these into the IDH wild type astrocytomas, 
the IDH mutant astrocytomas, and then we further subdivide the IDH mutant astrocytomas based on another molecular classification for oligodendrogliomas called the 1P19Q code deletion. So to show what that looks like here based on the 2016 classification, um, IDH wild type grading from two to four, IDH mutant grading from two to four, um, and then um, the IDH mutant with the 1P19Q code deletion. Um, so it's our um, molecular features that are driving how we classify this. Now this changed again in 2020, um, and in a way that simplified it, but probably also complicated it. Um, and here the 20, sorry, 2021, um, the 2021 classification basically said, if, if your status is IDH wild type, then this is a glioblastoma. And we're gonna, and the, the phenotype here is gonna trump um, what we see on histology. So today, all IDH wild type tumors that come to our clinic really have no choice in this classification system other than being glioblastoma. And that's the clear delineating feature here, IDH wild type versus IDH mutant. And then within IDH mutant, even the grade four tumors, we no longer call glioblastoma and today call them grade four astrocytoma. So this might look simple, but when we are actually in clinic, um, it becomes a little bit more complicated. On the left here is the, the sort of processing we go through with our pathologist based on the standard molecular diagnostic features, but some other additional characteristic genetic alterations that help us understand these tumor types. Um, and then we make a decision about where this fits in the World Health Organization 2021 classification. But if you remember all the clinical trials I discussed early on, none of those had any of these molecular features. So then we have to sit down and think through those trials and the 2016 terminology, but even more importantly, the terminology prior to that in 2007, which is based, based purely on histology. And how do we translate that? How do we look back at those trials and then extrapolate what our current classification system tells us about treatment? In many times, we can't really um, make that and we have to do our best guess. Um, there have been thoughts of redoing some of those trials. That's hard because we lack equipoise with some of these treatments. And it's also hard um, because some of these tumors are really rare. Um, so one of those studies um, that I presented is called RTOG 9802. That means it was initiated in 1998. Um, the first publication of that was in 2013. Um, and that involved uh, the United States, Canada, and Europe. Um, probably over several hundred sites enrolling those patients. So redoing these trials is not really feasible, but we need to be thinking smartly about how we do the next generation of trials and how can we anticipate the molecular features that we don't yet know about? Um, and can we put in the resources to really have full gene sequencing of these tumors as we enroll patients on clinical trials? The next shift that's been really close to my heart has been this shift in patient-centered care. Um, and moving us from thinking through entirely about survival and molecular features, um, but to what the patient is experiencing um, and, what, and how we can improve their day-to-day -day life. So no symptom is more prominent in our patients than seizures. Um, this uh, on the top is the original practice parameter put together by the American Academy of Neurology um, that when looking at data stated that if a patient with a brain tumor comes in and they have not had a seizure, there is no evidence to support the use of prophylactic anti-epileptic therapy. Um, challenges with that guideline were that there actually weren't randomized clinical trials to inform it. Um, they found that the patients who were getting anti-epileptics had a significant amount of toxicity. That was in 2000, and that was where the arsenal of drugs was really limited to dilantin, uh, phenobarbital, Depakote, and Tegretol. Um, an update of that was done um, through our neuro-oncology section and through the Society of Neuro-Oncology and actually came up with the same um, results. Um, we have newer anticonvulsants and they're better tolerated, but there still hadn't been any good clinical trials that told us what to do about this. So this became um, something that one of my mentees, Tom Wachowski, became really interested in um, when he was actually a chief resident rotating through our clinic. Um, and he um, decided to design a study looking at our own practice. He was convinced 
that with well-tolerated anti-epileptic drugs um, and with how many times he saw patients in our practice coming in with new seizures, um, that there was really a role for prophylaxis here. So um, he retrospectively studied our patient population. He found that um, a third of our patients with glioblastoma present with seizures, and that's, in, um, con that's consistent with other literature. But of the remaining, the ones who started out seizure naive, a third eventually have a seizure. Um, and that we thought was a substantial number because when they came in with a seizure, um, they often had to go into the emergency room. They were maybe briefly admitted. They um, had impact on driving privileges. Um, and they also had some um, emotional um, stress from this and some fear of recurrence of their tumor. So this was something that was a quality of life um, impact on our patients. He also found that, um, that in, in the patients of our cohort that developed status epilepticus, um, anyone receiving an AED did not develop status epilepticus. And we found that in those few patients who had status, that that was a really poor indicator um, for their survival and for their quality of life, often requiring them um, to have a real clinical decline, neurologic decline, and sometimes a, a nursing facility. And he also found that with the drugs that we were using, um, we rarely were having to change drugs, that, that patients were generally tolerating these AEDs and concluded that we really need to reconsider the AAN practice parameter. Um, now that seems like it would be straightforward, but that has been very um, controversial. Um, this is the only study that attempted to look at prophylaxis in a randomized fashion. Um, and they struggled with enrollment. Um, they struggled with people, keeping people on the study. And then they struggled with identifying what the right outcomes were and how do you, how do you measure um, success in a study like this. And they actually, um, in their conclusion, recommended that this trial should not be attempted in the future. Um, Tom Wachowski didn't agree with this, and he has been persistent about um, pushing forward in this area. And he's designed a um, natural history study. Um, this is being funded by the Empire Clinical Research Investigator Program. Um, and what he's doing is identifying new patients with gliomas um, through our clinic and then following them. And so we follow the patients who have tumor-related epilepsy and we follow the patients who are seizure naive and we follow them for standard clinical outcomes that we collect, but we're also collecting prospectively the semiology of their seizures, the frequency of their seizures, and we're doing quality of life surveys throughout to really get a sense of the impact of epilepsy on their quality of life. We're about four years into this study now um, and at a point where we um, should be ready to start presenting some data. The goal of this study is explicitly to help us inform how to design that next generation of clinical trials um, for this disease. Um, what he's also doing um, is starting um, the, um, the basics of a prophylaxis study. And so um, this study we should be opening relatively soon um, and this is looking at safety and tolerability of bravateracetam um, for prophylaxis in tumor-related epilepsy. Um, and here patients are going to be randomized to bravateracetam or, um, or standard, which is no, pro no prophylaxis today. And we're looking at toxicity, but we're also looking at feasibility of randomization. Do patients um, get on a trial like this? So patients who have a you know, newly diagnosed GPM, they have a lot going on in their life, they may be looking at a treatment trial for their tumor. Will they also go on a study like this and can we reasonably randomize patients on a study like this? Or do they have fears about randomization? And then outcomes we're looking at are time to first seizure and then the incidence of epilepsy so that we can help design what that next clinical trial um, looks like and develop the statistics for that. Um, this was um, this the work of this is being funded by the Neuro Next Fellowship originally, but also by the industry portion of this, and that's really the reason we're using pervateracetam, was that was um, a, a drug that industry was willing to um, pay for. Now the other area that we've started to look at is how this affects cost, um, and we looked at insurance claims um, from a large insurance company. We found that um, six months after diagnosis, the costs of having a GBM were very significant. Um, but what really surprised us um, was how significant the inpatient costs were. Um, we don't have a lot of control about the outpatient costs when it comes to radiation um, and chemotherapy. And this is largely a disease that we take care of as an outpatient. We're not giving inpatient therapies other than their original diagnosis. 
Um, and so we hypothesized from this that a lot of this cost was from um, admissions during the course of their disease. Um, and so based on that, um, one of our residents, who's now um, one of our faculty, um, started a study um, looking at why our patients go into the hospital. Um, and so we looked at um, acute care utilization in glioblastoma. And so this included um, a visit to the emergency room or a different emergency room, an admission into the hospital or an ICU admission. Not surprisingly, she found that more than half of the indications for admission were neurologic. Um, others included a mix of medical, surgery, infectious, falls, and venous thromboembolism. Within the neurologic indications, the vast majority were seizures. Um, and so this led to the next set of studies on this. And we asked the question of how do we reduce acute, acute care visits for epilepsy? We found that many of these patients who were coming in with seizures were coming in just to the emergency room and being sent home. Some were coming in and getting admitted and going home the next day. Um, often patients were coming in with a seizure and by the time they were seen by a physician in the emergency room, they were back to their baseline. And then the other thing she found was that um, just less than, just over half of patients were able to still go home. And so we started thinking about these admissions as an indicator of things going badly, an indicator of poor prognosis. Um, you can see that 17% went to a subacute nursing facility and 16% went to hospice from these admissions. And we started asking ourselves, uh, how, how can we better predict this? Um, for a patient um, with a glioblastoma, why do they need to come into the hospital to transition to a subacute nursing facility or a hospice? There's cost to this, there's emotional trauma to this. What could we be doing better as an outpatient practice um, to be able to make those transitions um, easier. Um, and so those are some studies that I'm also going to talk about. Um, the other thing that we found in this, um, and if you look at um, the, the area within the circle here, um, this represents about 20% um, of the patients who were on this study. And they were spending more than 10% of their remaining time alive in the hospital. Um, and so we thought of this as a real kind of um, quality of life burden um, that, that they had to spend this much of their remaining life in the hospital and that this was a real um, challenge for us on how to make this better for patients. So Dr. Wasilewski designed the next study, which was to reduce um, patients coming in um, due to seizures. And um, so she created an intervention. Um, and here we identified patients and their care caregivers, consented them, um, and put them through a 10-point PowerPoint presentation um, that she or our nurse or an advanced practice provider delivered, educated them about seizures, about rescue medications, about who to call, when to call, and reassured them about times where um, they could stay home, give us a phone call, and we may be able to manage these things at home. So she, we had a pretest, an intervention, and a post-test, um, and then did this again at two months and six months. What she found was that this was really feasible to do. It didn't actually delay us in our clinic very much. There were improvement in test scores over time, so patients and caregivers were retaining this information and being educated. Patients had less distress about seizures um, when they knew that you know, the likelihood was that you know, they weren't going to die from the seizure or that the seizure didn't automatically represent progression of disease. Um, and then when we looked at qualitative data, patients felt really informed um, and empowered. Now, um, the challenge with this was, despite all of this, patients still came to the hospital. When Dr. Wasilewski was a resident, um, she went down to the ED to see one of these patients. She had recently done the intervention on them. The patients were thankful. They felt really secure about it. They th thought it was a great idea. And then she asked them, well, why did you come into the hospital? And they said, well, I called the on-call physician and the on-call physician told me to come in. Um, and at that time, our on-call was either neurology residents or hematology oncology fellows. Sometimes patients would call their primary care physicians. And really across the board, when folks heard the combination of glioblastoma and a seizure, um, everyone told those patients to come in. Um, and so um, from there, um, she designed the next study. Um, and this is what we are starting now. And this is called the SHAPE study. Um, the SH stands for seizure hotline. 
This is in newly diagnosed GBM patients. We do the seizure education intervention as she described in the previous study. And then we create a seizure hotline. And so here, the patient, when they're having a seizure, um, can immediately contact um, one of the attending neuro-oncologists or the neuro-oncology advanced practice providers. And so all a group of people who feel comfortable helping patients manage seizures um, in the context of their brain tumors at home. Um, and outcomes here we're looking at are feasibility from the patient point of view. Um, how, do, do, do patients feel comfortable with this setup? Do they feel comfortable sometimes managing these seizures at home? Um, feasibility from the provider point of view, how much does this um, affect us? So I'll give you an example. Um, I took care of a patient last night who had several seizures um, and several texts and phone calls through the evening, um, the last one being at about 1 a.m. So how does that make me feel as a provider on a night when I'm not on call and I'm giving grand rounds the next day that I get woken up at one in the morning um, to be able to help them with a seizure medicine? Um, or, or help them keep them out of the emergency room. This is a patient I know well. It's a patient I know is we're, will be transitioning to hospice in the next few months likely. Um, and it's a patient that I, I and the family really wanna keep out of the emergency room, um, especially at a time right now in our system where we know that they will have a long wait there. Um, so we'll be collecting information about that and then we'll be collecting information about how successful this um, intervention is um, on the whole. Now, the other area that we've really been thinking about for the last several years um, is palliative care. Um, this is a landmark paper that was published in non-small cell lung cancer. This is more than five years old now. Um, and I'm gonna go right to sort of the meat of the paper here, which show that if you instituted early palliative care in metastatic lung cancer patients, they actually lived longer than if they got standard care. Um, so, they lived longer, they had better scores related to depression and quality of life, and they were less likely to get unnecessary chemotherapy near the end of life. So all important outcome measures. Um, and because of this paper, and this really changed approach to end-stage cancer across um, oncology, um, the American Society of Clinical Oncology um, put together an opinion recommending integration of palliative care into standard oncology care. Um, and that this leads to better patient and caregiver outcomes. And so that's something we have start to, started to grapple with in our practice. One of the challenges in brain tumor patients is that many of their symptom control issues are neurologic. Um, and so we found we would send them to palliative care, but their issues were seizures, headaches, sometimes headaches related to increased intracranial pressure, cognitive problems, aphasia, hemiparesis, um, and, and, and these were really, this was really neurologic care that they needed. It's unusual for brain tumor patients to have pain, dyspnea, um, or some of the other um, common things that other oncology patients see. So we felt like we needed to sort of better study this to understand it. So Lauren Hemiger, who was a um, medical student at the time, she's now in our practice. Um, she um, started looking at this and she looked at um, defined quality measures from the American Society of Quality, um, American Society of Clinical Oncology, and looked at what we were doing in our practice and whether we were meeting those quality measures. We had a lot of outcomes from the paper, um, but the key one here um, that we've, we've decided to follow up on um, was our compliance with advanced directives. So advanced directive here um, is defined um, really is just even a simple healthcare proxy. It doesn't actually need to be a more detailed discussion, but we also looked at treatment limiting orders or what we know in New York State as most forms. These are um, area under the curve graphs, and, and this is the percentage of life um, in which patients in our practice did not have an advanced directive, and this is the percentage of life in which they did not have a most form. This becomes really important in a disease like glioblastoma where um, we can't really predict how quickly they might progress. That's one issue. And we also cannot predict um, entirely whether they're gonna have, to what extent they're gonna have cognitive and speech problems. And so one of the things that she found in this um, study was that many of our patients, um, when we got to the point of a most form, those most forms were being signed by proxies, that the patients didn't actually have input um, into some of their end-of-life care goals. 
Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit in a couple of slides about some studies that we're doing to really try and address that and integrate this early um, into um, our treatment. The other study we um, did as an offshoot from this is to really look at um, decision-making in patients with glioblastoma. And so we used a tool that's used in psychiatry called the MACAT-T, MacArthur Assessment for Treatment. Um, and it's really this um, back and forth discussion with a patient where you really try to assess um, whether they're able to make a um, treatment decision um, and, and to what extent they understand the decisions they're making. Our, um, our goal eventually was to be able to do this in patients as they're consenting for clinical trials to get a sense of whether they really understand um, what they're getting into. So we enrolled patients in this who were in the process of making a decision that was either a treatment decision, a decision about continuing therapy or a decision about hospice. We evaluated them with a MOCA. Um, an arbitrary assessment, um, a, a physician assessment of the patient's ability to make a decision, which is, has historically been arbitrary. That's, you know, I go in in the room, I talk to the patient, and sort of at the end of the conversation, I feel like, well, you know, this patient gets it. Um, and then um, the actual intervention tool. And what we found is that in all of the patients that this assessment tool found deficits in reasoning that we did not pick up either on a MOCA or our neurologic exam or our, our, our own assessments. Um, and so we are struggling with how to take this study forward, um, partly because this assessment tool took a long time. Um, it took one to two hours um, for, this was a, um, an undergraduate student who did this study and she would sit there for one to two hours with the patient. So some patients aren't going to be willing to do that. Um, and in terms of a busy clinic, that's not really feasible to do. So we're really trying to figure out a shorter tool that we can do to really assess reasoning. Now, going back to um, advanced care planning, um, after Dr. Hemminger's study, um, we decided that we would try to figure out a way to incorporate an early advanced care visit um, in our patients with malignant gliomas. And the original intent was that sometime in the middle of radiation, we were going to set a specific visit, we would give them information about it, we would invite them and their families to come in, and we would um, talk about it, um, and then look at outcomes of whether we're able to complete most forms earlier. Um, and then, and the protocol was written, and then the pandemic hit. <clears throat> um, and so we couldn't do that. This was not something that we were bringing in patients in person specifically to do. But what we started doing um, is doing these visits on telehealth. And what we found is that when we did it through telehealth, we were worried that this would be a very difficult conversation to have on telehealth through computer screens. But what we found is um, patients loved being at home during these visits. Um, you know, they didn't have to come and drive in and check in and then check out of a clinic and navigate the parking garage. And for some of our patients who are one to three hours away, um, after having a deep discussion like this, they're not, you know, stuck in a car. Um, and so patients liked being in their homes for this. The other thing we found that we really weren't anticipating is we were able to engage family members from all over the country on this. So often their sons, daughters, siblings lived in other states, and they could be present on a Zoom conference and be just as present as everybody else. And we were able to have, you know, really good discussions that helped them understand what prognosis was. Um, and, and we haven't been able to prove this yet, but I would hypothesize that that's going to help us in our end of life care, because often we get to these situations where the patient and spouse understand what's going on, but their adult kids are sort of surprised um, about what's going on. So Dr. Hardy, um, who's one of our faculty, um, designed this study focused on doing that whole process through early telehealth. Um, it's with the assistance of uh, Benzi Kluger, who's one of our neuropalliative care specialists, um, and we have a structured visit set up. Um, we're gonna be doing this all by um, telehealth um, and then set outcomes from the provider point of view and also from the patient point of view. Um, and this has opened and we started doing this with studies. We did this in about 25 patients before this opened um, and found universally that patients like this. And then the last palliative care study that we're still um, putting data together on run by Lauren Hemminger is a prospective um, quality of life study looking at both um, patients and caregivers. 
goals of this are to really inform design of a future randomized clinical trial. So think back to that lung cancer study. How do we design that study in brain tumor patients? Um, the purpose of this is to gain some of that data to be able to do that. Um, and so we're looking at all kinds of um, outcomes here um, so that we can better define what kind of study to do next. Um, she has been able to um, enroll 75 patients on this study and 100 caregivers. The caregiver work is going to be presented at the AAN, hopefully, in Seattle um, in April with qualitative data and quantitative data. It's actually the largest caregiver study um, in patients with glioblastoma. And then the final shift I'm going to talk about is our shift in access. Um, this is where we are in um, Rochester. No one in downstate New York knows where Rochester is. When I moved from New York um, to Rochester, um, one of a, a very educated neighbor of mine um, was trying to convince me that I could take Metro North up to Rochester. Um, and I had to show them on a map that this is actually 350 miles away. Um, this is not all Westchester. But so Rochester is up here. We're closer to Canada and Toronto than anything else. Um, and while we are in a city here, we have a large rural catchment area. Um, and so we have patients going out in Totsigo County at Cooperstown um, for whom it's a three and a half hour drive to get to us. Patients in Binghamton, two, two and a half hours. Um, and so how we deliver the care to these patients has really been a challenge. And this traditional model of neuro-oncology where we exist in the tertiary and coordinary care academic centers and everybody comes to us um, leaves a lot of patients behind. And we need to really be rethinking that model. Um, one of the ways to address that is to better educate medical oncologists who are taking care of about 50% of these patients in the United States um, and setting standards for them. So we put together um, a neuro-oncology quality measurement set, set a few years ago so we can really help medical oncologists understand the importance of a multidisciplinary care plan in their treatment, the importance of molecular testing based on World, World Health Organization, the importance of chemotherapy education for these patients and how to do that in patients who might have cognitive deficits, um, post-operative MRIs in order to get a good baseline, there's strong data for that, um, and then um, interventions for venous thromboembolism to prevent, um, to prevent that. The other way is we are in the process of um, publishing um, guidelines that are really um, geared towards medical oncologists. This is a collaboration between the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the Society for Neuro-Oncology. Um, and this paper is, is going to be published literally any day. I was hoping it would get out so that I could share more of it, but I can share at least the title. Um, and this is our attempt at looking at several hundred clinical trials <clears throat> over the past 20 years, coming up with clear guidelines for each glioma tumor type, putting that in the context of new World Health Organization classification, and giving guidance for medical oncologists throughout the country for whom brain tumors are only 1% or 2% of their practice so that they understand what, um, what needs to be done. So this was, it should be coming out momentarily. Um, and we're going to be looking at ways into studying how this has changed practice amongst medical oncologists. Um, and then we've looked at access um, related to special populations. So um, we did this study looking at where clinical trials in glioblastoma, clinical trial access is a big part of our field. So where are clinical trials for patients with glioblastoma? Um, what we found in this study is that they are not in rural communities. And there were virtually no clinical trials that were in zip codes or counties that were identified as rural. So all of these patients have to travel. Um, and how do we solve that problem? Um, especially as we're trying to develop new therapeutics and understand them. And we need these patients to be on our trials to um, figure out the next steps more quickly. And we need to be able to provide them with access. And then the second study that we published last year, we tried to look at disparities in patient enrollment, who's actually getting onto clinical trials. Um, and what we found is that the patients who are getting on GBM clinical trials are significantly younger than the median age of glioblastoma. So we are on some level excluding the older populations. And that's not a surprise. We're seeing that in other um, oncology fields. We tried to look at um, what the racial makeup was on clinical trials, and we couldn't even make a conclusion because only 8% of the clinical trials in GBM um, actually reported race um, in their paper. 
And so we don't even, we can't even make a conclusion about whether non-white individuals are underrepresented in this clinical trial. So we've asked that people consider um, transparent reporting of race on their studies. Um, and we need to be making sure that we are enrolling all populations as we go forward. Um, and then um, we've worked together to really kind of quickly get out guidance for folks. So as the pandemic um, came through in March of 2020, a group of us um, very quickly wrote a guideline paper. This was not based on evidence, but we had fears um, that in some systems, patients with neurocologic diseases who needed treatment and for whom surgery and emergent therapies were indicated would not get them. And we had other fears that some neuro-oncologic patients um, who could wait and where therapy could be deferred would be unnecessarily treated um, and could be at risk of exposure. Um, and so as a group, we came together and put together um, guidance on this. One of the things we also highlighted on this is that with telehealth, um, we would be looking at a changing world in neuro-oncology. And this could be one of those areas where we could start to address some of that research um, access. Um, this is a slide um, that I put together probably in 2016. Um, this is our advanced practice provider, Jennifer Cerventi. And as part of her master's project, um, she created um, a telehealth program for our neuro-oncology division <clears throat> um, with the goals of really reaching out to our rural populations. Um, we had barrier after barrier after barrier related to technology, the electronic record, state laws, um, our own um, contracting. Um, and at the time prior to the pandemic, we were only able to do telemedicine in one of these clinics um, in Dansville that you know, ended up being about one to two patients a month. The pandemic changed that rapidly. It's now become a big part of our practice. It allows us to really reach out to all of these distant communities. <clears throat> and I think our next step is in thinking through how we can do that better with clinical trials. So we've worked with the NCI and the neuro-oncology branch um, to really advocate for telehealth um, in neuro-oncology and neuro-oncology clinical trials to make the statement that we actually can provide very good patient-centered care and communication um, through these modalities. And we actually are successful in seeing new patients and patients who are transitioning to hospice in these modalities. Um, this is our APP doing a telehealth visit. Um, and this is with actually a couple who live in the UK who are on an expanded access trial. And then um, in this picture, we've got a patient in the center with his wife, but he's got three daughters on this telehealth visit, one who lives in Malaysia, one who lives in Paris, and one who lives in California. And we couldn't have had that level of integrated care um, before telehealth. So there are real advantages here that we need to be really thinking of. And then finally, how do we incorporate all of this, um, <clears throat> all of these shifts um, in our clinical practice? Um, and one way we decided to do that is in our actual org chart. Um, and so we created a patient and caregiver advisory council and a community advisory board so we could hear about quality of life issues for our patients, the rural issues and the access issues. Um, and then we amended our mission statement so that we weren't looking only at um, extending lives of patients, but we were e explicitly looking to improve lives of our patients. And then finally, it's in how we build our teams. Um, and while we do clinical trials and we do some um, uh, genomics, molecular classification, um, we have um, intentionally recruited people who are focused on some of these issues. So Sarah Hardy runs a cancer and cognition clinic. Um, Andrea Wazalewski is focused on older patients with GBM and how to deliver therapies to them. Michael White runs our CNS metastases program, a whole other population with needs. And then Lauren Heminger is continuing her work related to um, caregiver engagement. We have a dedicated tumor rep related epilepsy clinic run by Tom Wojciechowski. That's been actually doing great in a virtual setting. Um, and then we have integrated um, neuropalliative care into our clinic. And I think I lost this slide. Um, integrated neuropalliative care into our clinic with both a chaplain and a neuropalliative care expert. And then we really work to teach our APPs to be able to do telehealth, to be able to do the advanced care planning visits um, so that we can deliver this care as best as we can. So I went right up to 959 and I'm apologetic for that, but I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohil. That was a wonderful lecture. I think uh, we just opened the uh, microphone from questions. Direct, uh, one question from the chat. Uh, 
Uh, that was an early question. There are two questions actually from the chat. One is from uh, both of them are from residents. Um, so the first question is about uh, uh, param panel. That's an AMPA antagonist. Uh, so the question goes like, uh, param panel show it that on cellular level decreases the chance of local recurrences. Can we use uh, that as a switch prophylaxis while offering benefit of lowering chance of recurrences? Yeah, so we've actually tried to look into parampanel for this. Um, you know, the, the other rationale for parampanel is there's this great data, um, basic science data, about glutamate um, being a driver of epilepsy in patients um, uh, with gliomas. Gliomas release glutamate. There's some changes in the cysteine glutamate transporter, um, and and when you when you kind of um, block that pathway, I mean, animal models you can really reduce epilepsy. So that's one reason to look at parampanel. Um, and, but we haven't done that in more detail. It's something to think about. I don't have a lot of experience with parampanel sort of clinically. And I don't think our epilepsy folks have been very enthusiastic about it. Um, and then the second thing is um, the challenge with the um, decreasing chance of local recurrence is that we're seeing that in parampanel, but we also see it in Depakote. Um, we see it in probably half of the seizure medicines. And we don't know what to do with that when we put that into large, sort of larger randomized trials We've never seen any real benefit from that. So I'm not sure um, how convincing that benefit is. Okay, so next question uh, is, uh, could you tell us about the development of immunotherapy such as uh, CAR-T therapy in GVM? Yeah, so two, um, two areas of immunotherapy development. One is the more traditional immunotherapies that have been approved for lung cancer and melanoma. These are the treatments that um, allow your immune system to really kind of um, um, go un unleashed um, and attack the cancers themselves. All of the clinical trials for them so far have been negative. Um, we're still working on redefining how to do those clinical trials because one of the challenges is a lot of these patients were on steroids. Um, and that can be uh, suppressing the immune response. So how can we find like a real steroid naive um, population or population that doesn't need steroids who could, where we could effectively study immunotherapies? Um, CAR-T, one um, phenomenal case report on CAR-T in New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago that got us all excited. Um, and a patient with leptomeningeal metastases from GBM where you'd expect survival to be only weeks um, who had a long-term disease control with a CAR-T therapy. None of that has panned out any further. Um, and so, and, and we're not seeing CAR-T panning out yet um, outside of liquid tumors. So it's, it has a real role in, in lymphoma and now in myeloma, but in the solid tumors, we're not yet um, seeing that. So I don't know what the future of CAR-T is there. I do think there's a future for CAR-T in primary CNS lymphoma. Um, and there, there could be some real meaningful impact there. Okay, there is uh, another question. This is from our PITS neurology team. The question is about seizure treatment at home uh, by patients. Do you prescribe only rescue medications or do you advance with other <clears throat> antiepileptic uh, drugs, medications? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for patients who can really get it and we can trust them um, and they're concerned about it, we will um, work with them on having some rescue medications at home. Um, and especially if they're having some breakthrough. Um, I think, uh, but otherwise, if they're really breaking through regularly, um, you know, we would want to either maximize that AED or add in a second one. We sometimes have to be careful about it because, you know, a second AED on top of chemotherapy and steroids and radiation and their ongoing fatigue, um, you know, sometimes for them, it's not worth the benefits and, and they might prefer to not be on that second AED, um, I do think our patients with brain tumors have more side effects from AEDs than the non-brain tumor population. I don't think we have data for that, um, but that's my suspicion. So we're, we're just careful about that. Okay, and uh, there is Hi, a question. Good morning. Uh, oh, is yeah. it okay if I ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure. Good yeah, thank you. Good morning, Dr. Mohil. I am Aparna Pariyadit. I'm a neurological applicant this uh, season. So uh, my question is that, what are your thoughts and uh, experiences on therapeutic peptide vaccine like rindopepimod for treating newly diagnosed uh, glioblastoma? Yeah, I mean, the rindopepinut study was something that was um, very exciting. So this, was, this is a vaccine directed at a specific, um, um, at a specific uh, receptor, the EGFR-B3 receptor. 
which is overactive in glioblastoma. Um, the phase two studies of this were very promising. Um, and we really thought that this was gonna go to approval. Um, the phase three study was negative. Um, and that's been the story of GBM, unfortunately, for, for decades. Um, and so, so Rinda Puppinet, I think, doesn't have any role. There are other vaccines, and that's many of the, the treatments we're looking at now. There are other vaccines in clinical trials. I, I don't think I can say that there's one that looks better than another, um, but I do think it is one potential way um, to go after these tumors. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Sorry for cutting you. Sorry. Thank That's you. Fine. No, no, that was quite fine. Uh, Dr. Mohil, there is another question from the chat. Uh, it's from our, one of our epileptic attendants. It says, uh, are there any anti-epileptic medications that should be avoided due yeah. to drug to drug interactions? With the yeah, so great therapy. question. Um, and it's something I, you know, probably I should, I need to incorporate that into this lecture because that is um, kind of a very important point there. In the acute setting, no. So if a patient comes in in status and they need um, you know, treatment for status, you do whatever your institutional protocols are and whether that's Dilantin or Keppra or Vimpat, there's, there's no issues there. Um, and then we as neuro-oncologists will work in the outpatient setting of transitioning them. Um, we want to avoid enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drugs because they do induce the metabolism of many chemotherapies that are metabolized through the liver. And so you actually get lower chemotherapy levels and less effective chemotherapy. And there are also contraindications for most clinical trials in GBM. So we try to avoid all enzyme-inducing AEDs. Amongst the non-enzyme-inducing, um, levetiracetam is commonly used. I do think we see more behavioral problems in that population than you would in um, the non-brain tumor population. Drugs like Tegretol and Trileptol, I think we see more hyponatremia, than, um, and, and I've found that to be challenging. Challenges with a drug like Depakote are um, they're on steroids and they're already getting weight gain and tremor. And so sometimes this can make that worse. Um, Vimpat, um, some patients have some tr trouble tolerating due to sedation. <clears throat> Lamotrigine is just a great drug for a lot of these patients. Um, and we'll use it in our low grade glioma patients, but in a GBM patient who has to go through six weeks of radiation and chemotherapy, and there's so many moving parts, we've just found it really hard um, to do that ramp up um, without making things too complicated. Okay, let me see. Is there, I, had, I think we had space for one more question. If someone wants to use a microphone. Uh, if not, I think Dr. Mojil, this was a very interesting like uh, talk. Uh, we're really glad that you're accepting our invitation uh, to be with us at this time. And uh, if anything, I will let the, uh, anyone to want to contact Dr. Mogil, I will like uh, pass your information if you had more uh, further questions. Yes, yes. Anyone interested in neuro-oncology or anything, just uh, reach out to me. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay,